I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Stanley Kubrick is kinda crazy. Stanley Kubrick was his name, he lived on the line between genius and insane, and because of him, cinema has never been the same. He was a perfectionist, always had a plan, all of his films are about the dehumanization of man. The greatest of all time? Probably. He began his career in photography. Quickly learning and perfecting his art, Stanley was so crazy, uh, wh where do I start? I could start at the very beginning, where he hustled chess and lived off tournament winnings. He was a clever child, he could sure dance, Stanley funded his first film with his father's life insurance. He almost killed his actors with poisonous gas. Stanley hates this film, and he tried to erase it from his past. That's right, he really doesn't want you to watch it, but it's on Netflix now, so nothing can stop it. His next film was The Killer's Kiss, which earned him some respect. He would often stop production to go pick up his $30 unemployment check. On day one of the killing, even though Stanley was just a beginner, he threatened to fire the DP, who was an Oscar winner. This film confused audiences because of its non-linear plot. Kubrick was a master of all genres, whether you like it or not. And one of those genres was war. He would do lots of takes and then he would do some more, like this prison scene. It took 74. And the dinner scene took 68 takes, but Stanley never cared. Each time a new roasted duck was freshly prepared. Paths of Glory was banned in France for depicting their military in a negative light, and Kurt Douglas used a chair as a weapon during a Stanley Kubrick fight. Yes, some of the actors didn't really consider him a friend, but he married the singing German girl who appears at the end. Then his budget got a little bit bigger, he was hired on Spartacus for his next picture. He pretty much did the film for the money and to further his career, like a strategic move in chess. He numerically labeled each corpse with detailed instructions in this organized chaotic mess. Once again, Kirk Douglas and Kubrick always fought. Stanley disowned the movie and from then on demanded Final Cut. This film won Best Cinematography, even though the cinematographer quit. Maybe it won the Oscar because Stanley actually filmed it. Next, he moved on from The Sword and the Sandal to make Lolita and cause some glorious scandal. The plot itself is just plain crazy about a creepy creep who obsesses over a very young lady. Tarnation, you old horn toad. That's mighty pretty. That's a pretty poem. Kubrick was crazy to cast Peter Sellers, but he was just crazy enough to direct him, and the Catholic Church said this crazy film would send you directly in hell's direction. His next venture was a satire, so true and strange it's frightful. <laughs> Dr. Strange Love, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb was its very strange title. Kubrick insisted that the war table be green, even though the film was black and white. Originally, the film ended with a slapstick pie fight. Stanley tricked George C. Scott into capturing his maximum wackiness by using his silly takes that he thought were just for practice. Uh, that's right, sir. The film crew accidentally flew over a military base and were thought to be Soviet spies. The original script was told through extraterrestrial eyes. This film will make you laugh until it hurts. Kubrick read 50 books on nuclear war for research. Dr. Strangelove inspired the government to change their military policy. Next, this mad genius would tackle interstellar technology. At first, hundreds of people walked out of this sci-fi movie until hippies saw it on shrooms and said it was groovy. This film predicted the iPad and secretly called out IBM. Stanley recorded his own breathing. Yeah, that's actually him. On his first meeting with Arthur C. Clarke, they both saw a UFO. And Stanley approached Pink Floyd to do the music, don't you know? On set, Stanley would play chess with a real computer, machine versus men, and of course, Stanley would always, always win. He also watched many science fiction movies, hundreds no doubt, and wanted an insurance policy in case alien life was discovered before the movie came out. 2001 is more than just a cinematic space epic, it's a religious experience and you must respect it. This film is hard to understand, so you need to be very understanding, especially when you realize Stanley might have helped fake the moon landing. His next film never actually happened, and it would have been about Napoleon. Makes you really, really wonder what could have been. Kubrick was definitely a man of mystery and was obsessed with this figure from historic history. No one, not no one knows Bonaparte better. Kubrick even knew the patterns in the historical weather, but he abandoned the project. That must have been hard, since he cataloged every single day of Napoleon's life on index cards. 
Stanley had a terrible phobia of flying, even though he was a licensed pilot. His next film was about the ultra-violent, just like clockwork, you can even time it. Of course, the final shot of A Clockwork Orange was done in 74 takes. Kubrick added this scene when he learned of Malcolm McDowell's fear of snakes. Kubrick tricked Malcolm into becoming his friend, and once production was over, Stanley never spoke to him again. But I'm sure Malcolm had fun, I really hope he did, considering his eye was scratched and he broke a rib. They spit on poor Malcolm until this actor's mouth was dry. This film used mostly natural light, that's no lie. In this film, Kubrick references himself. Just take a look at the futuristic album shelf. Movie Easter eggs are always fun, so keep an eye open for 2001. Remember the sped up sex scene that felt oh so wrong? Stanley originally planned the shot to last 26 minutes long. He only made this actor carry him three times, which for Kubrick that was nice. Hey, I just realized he's cast Darth Vader twice. And if that's not crazy, then I don't know what crazy is. Kubrick himself pulled the film from British theaters after receiving death threats towards his kids. This film is truly an example of life imitating art and things because it inspired real life violence from real life violent gangs. Yes, the film was blamed for murder. Now isn't that dumb? Did I say murder? Well, I meant red rum. But before we go there, let's take it back some. Kubrick's next film was called Barry Lynn Dunn. This is a great film. Stanley really handled it right and lit most of it by candlelight. He did this with a special lens developed by those NASA folks, which is more evidence that he filmed this massive hoax. This movie put Stanley on the IRA's hit list and took two years to film. Are you hearing this? His next film was filled with subliminal messages that I really do not see. Apparently, this might have been about the terror of the Nazi. Maybe it's really about the struggle of America's native women and men, or it's Kubrick saying he faked the moon landing again. So many theories, I cannot keep them in order, but all I know is that this film is some damn good horror. Stanley and Stephen King didn't really like each other, and Stanley took it a little too far when he made this look like Stephen King's car. Stanley Kubrick would call Stephen King in the middle of the night. That's very odd. He would ask him spiritual questions and talk about God. When making the trailer, he defied the rating system and included the slaughter. Stanley lied to the MPAA and said it was just rusty water. The Shining's Labyrinth caused the crew to get lost in the fake snow on various days. Kubrick just laughed as they were trapped in his hilarious maze. <laughs> and when the soundstage burnt to ashes, once again Stanley just laughed, showing off his madness. Kubrick changed the script daily, and that's not all. He emotionally tortured poor Shelley Duvall. He can do some pretty cruel things when you're filming. Apparently, Stanley had a reason for this torment. He did it all for her character so she could perform it. Kubrick would bully her and scream and shout. This would make Shelly ill and her hair started to fall out. Oh, come on. What do you mean, roll Two video? Seconds. We're f***ing killing ourselves out here and you're going to be ready. I am too. I'm standing so right by the door. we play mood music? No, I can't Yeah, but when hear. you came out like this, you said it is... Oh, no, 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 we're sitting there because I say, wait yeah, a minute, okay, and then you say yeah, on the radio, But when you go. do it, you've got to look desperate, Shelley. You're just wasting everybody's time there. I can't even get this well, thing the door open. You Quite often, Stanley would cross many moral lines. The staircase scene was done 120 or more times. Duvall wasn't the only victim. There were others, like poor old Scatman Carruthers. He gave the hotel tour 85 times and endured 40 strikes with an axe. This scene was done 140 times. Those were some Scatman facts. Stanley's insanity really took a toll on those poor actors, and maybe it was meant to be watched simultaneously forwards and backwards. And here's a fact that is certainly neat. The Shining took five frickin' years to complete. The movie is absolutely terrifying, but behind the scenes was more scary. Every page of All Work and No Play was really typed out by Kubrick's poor secretary. This stuff is all true. I know it's it's hard to believe. After this film, Stanley moved to a ranch where he would rarely leave. It seems that Kubrick had a few screws loose. He was an eccentric, paranoid, lovable recluse. He never threw anything away. He was a hoarder. He filled his house with thousands of boxes to keep things in order. But the boxes weren't good enough, so Stanley designed his own. It must have been crazy to be at his home, which contained seven golden retrievers, four donkeys, 16 cats, plus more. And they would all lie around Kubrick's cutting room floor. He would leave 15 pages of instructions on how to take care of his beloved creatures. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, White Men Can't Jump, and The Jerk were his favorite Hollywood features. He would have VHS tapes of NFL games, Seinfeld, and The Simpson shipped to him from afar. Stanley loved Woody the Woodpecker and Roseanne Barr. But before you think that Kubrick was normal like you, let me remind you of his 200 IQ. Because of his craziness, the art of cinema did enhance. Stanley had a wardrobe full of identical shirts and pants. Stanley liked to be alone. He didn't want all that Hollywood racket. He spent years researching the Vietnam War for Full Metal Jacket.
The original actor quit because it was too darn hard. Stanley made Vincent D'Onofrio gain 70 pounds of lard, and when the first actor wasn't exactly on target, he was fired and Stanley brought in a real drill sergeant. You had best un yourself or I will unscrew your head and shut down your neck! Unfortunately, the film was overshadowed by Platoon, which Kubrick did regret. They spent months blowing up buildings to create this awesome set. Once Stanley crashed his car while scouting a location, but immediately got up and just continued the conversation. You would think he would shoot the head shaving scene first, but no, he did it last. He made the actors grow out their hair, then shave it off again, probably just for laughs. <laughs> His next film was supposed to be about the Holocaust and how the Jews were oppressed. But Kubrick gave up on the project. His extensive research made him depressed. Then he almost made AI, but eventually gave it to that Spielberg guy. He said, you know, you really ought to direct AI and I should produce it for you. And I was shocked. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> the media made up wild rumors and called Stanley a barking loon. Remember, it's not a Kubrick film unless it features a key scene in a bathroom. Yes, he always featured a toilet or a shower. Stanley refused to drive over 30 miles per hour. His last film was a doozy, I tell you what, and that film was called Eyes Wide Shut. It explored sexual taboos, your sins and your fears. Keep in mind that he hadn't made a film in 10 years. When it came to the real life relationship of Nicole and Tom, Stanley was very careless. He would deliberately cause tension in their loving marriage. Tom Cruise developed an ulcer, which caused so much pain. Kubrick originally wanted Steve Martin to star. Now that would have been insane. It took 14 months to film. The crew needed a lot of patience. Stanley considered this movie to be his greatest. Eyes Wide Shut will rattle your bones and make your knees shake. Stanley mathematically analyzed box office data to pick the perfect release date. This film is infamous for being very naughty and is covered with hidden messages about the Illuminati. He passed away one week after finishing this film. May he rest in peace. Kubrick died 666 days before 2001. Conspiracy or destiny? What if Stanley made more films? I will always wonder it. And he had a favorite tree and was buried under it. He's gone now, looking down from heaven. Or maybe he's just staying in room 237.